Hello, everyone, and welcome to my second interview on this channel. Today, we'll be talking to Professor Kenneth Harl. Professor Harl got his PhD in history from Yale and now works at Tulane University in Louisiana as professor of classical and Byzantine history. He now teaches about Greek, Roman, and Crusader history and has won numerous awards for teaching excellence. He has a number of great courses, including the Byzantine world, Roman the Barbarians, and the Peloponnesian War. Professor Harl, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope this will be useful to your subscribers. I think they will like this very much. So to start off, um, I've asked you a little bit about your time in, uh, in Anatolia and kind of what you found there, if you'd like to go over a bit of that. Um, like, let's start with some of the, the battlefields or where you think these battlefields are um, in Anatolia. Well, uh, of course, uh, my interest in Anatolia goes back very early in my life. I was always fascinated by um, the various civilizations on the peninsula, yeah. and it's acted as a bridgeway between Europe and the Middle East. Um, and in part, the military side of it goes back to Homer. I mean, yeah, um, right. one of the uh, uh, reading and translation, as I didn't read Greek then as a young boy, uh, the Iliad and all the battles and the different allies of the uh, Trojans, you know, right. where are these people? Right, right. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the site of Troy is one of the most difficult sites to figure out because of the way it was excavated. Um, and I really focused my interest on Roman history uh, and Byzantine history, because in Asia Minor is where essentially a Greek colonial population came to terms with Roman rule, and the result would be the Byzantine Empire. So some of the battles that were decisive in that period, uh, one was the Battle of Magnesia, um, fought probably in November, December 190 BC. Mm -hmm. And it was a definitive battle in which the Roman region, legion really proved its superiority over the phalanx. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And in my understanding of the f uh, battle, and I, I, I walked the battlefield, I drove around the topographer, we know pretty well where it was located. And uh, one of the remarkable things about ancient uh, historians is they pay a lot of close detail and attention to where the battle was fought. Mm -hmm. And if you can find the location, it should match up more or less with the description. Right. Uh, of course, there's changes that you have to account for. Yeah, of course. Uh, that would be true very much for uh, another battle I know quite well, Issus, which mm -hmm. I examined in conjunction with Granicus, the first two great battles of Alexander the Great, right. um, where the, um, the shoreline has changed at Issus at an unusually uh, fast rate, is what the geologists determine it. Oh, so, but once, once you are at the Pinaris River, the Pias Chaya, as it's called today in Turkish, mm -hmm. um, and you take that into account, that the shore is about where the main road is before they started building this highway further in, um, then everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you can understand the tactical uh, skill of Alexander in deploying his forces um, coming out of line of march into line of battle, having a commanding position on the right flank, overlooking the Persians who are much farther down. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, and again, this is reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, the archers who were screening the Persian infantry line on the Persian left uh, probably panicked and shot too early and the arrows fell short as Alexander's cavalry charged down. They, of course, turned uh, trying to get through the ranks of the infantry and through the whole line into panic. And before they knew it, right. the Macedonians were over the river. Um, you can see that very clearly mm. uh, once you're up there. Wow. Uh, um, and again, uh, it is a matter of locating the battlefield. Uh, where was the city of Issus? And there had been several proposals, uh, but, but, but marie Henri Gates and Charlie Gates, two archeologists and dear friends of mine who mm. excavate um, they're um, on the faculty at uh, Bill Kent University in Ankara. Okay. Uh, they're Americans. And uh, they finally pinpointed where Issus is and where the likely river is. And wow. so uh, that was definitive. I, I could not have done that reconstruction so accurately without the work of, of both of those friends of mine. And they uncovered a city called Kenneth Huyuk, uh, is the modern name. Um, and this is a city that goes down into the Crusader period and goes all the way back, oh gosh, uh, certainly into the Middle Bronze Age. Mm, uh, wow. 
And uh, there were some remarkable finds there, including elephant tusks uh, from the Middle Bronze Age. Um, dear friend of mine, she was the director of the American Research Institute in Turkey. She uncovered um, the bones of the tusk. Uh, it was exciting for her. Uh, <laughs> Tony <laughs> right. Cross, uh, marvelous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, much less by me. And um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, part of the evidence that the um, a fauna of the Levant was very similar to East Africa at the time. Wow. So you had lions and these small African elephants and other right. animals who essentially were wiped out with the intensive agriculture. Uh, Assyrian kings did a great job in massacring lions. They always <laughs> yeah. have these vast lion hunts. You see them on the reliefs. At, right, right. At yeah. Nineveh. Uh, and so um, all of these battles, uh, two of Alexander's battles, uh, the one that came out more recently on Tigrano Kerta in 69 BC is the mm -hmm. victory of Lucullus over Tigranes of Armenia. And that battle put Rome in the Middle East for 700 years. Right. right. It, it really um, committed Rome, a Mediterranean power, to somehow dealing with the wider Middle East and Iranian foes to the east. Yeah. Um, and again, that was a matter of um, carefully uh, reading the sources, uh, excavation reports. The, the look, it spent, I spent several summers trying to find it. <laughs> because, <laughs> again, you don't know, everyone has their opinion. Yeah, <laughs> and the yeah, Armenian nationalists are moving it all over the landscape, yeah, you know, I'm sure. making territorial claims. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, I was accompanied by my dear friend, Jason Sanchez, and uh, he was the one where we were wanting, uh, where when we spotted, um, he spotted the walls down by the river, uh, the Yarmus Suyu, which is the ancient Nicephorus. We went down there, and as soon as we descended, we were in a small rented car, um, which which got back to the owners more or less in shape. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always would jest when I would yeah. borrow cars uh, from the British Institute in London. I'd say, I returned it with all four wheels, including yeah. the steering wheel. <laughs> Of course, the director would be a little upset about that. <laughs> but um, uh, in any case, we found the Hellenistic walls and it seems to conform with the sketch by um, the British consul in Diabaker in uh, 1864. Wow. Uh, and uh, there's a scholar teaching in Greek Cyprus who'd never visited the site, but he felt that that was probably the best location. And, and sure enough, when you got up on the city walls and put yourself in the position of the mercenary garrison watching this battle, it fell in place. Um, the accounts, the ancient accounts, Appian, Plutarch, I was carrying my text with me or photocopies on. It, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the delights in dealing uh, with Asia Minor and, and with ancient history in general. Yeah. That, um, from a military standpoint, um, you think of Caesar's uh, great mm -hmm. battles, um, both in the Gaelic Wars and the Civil Wars, uh, you can really come to understand them um, by the kind of um, staff rides, uh, which were evolved by uh, the Germans in the late 19th century, and is the staple of West Point, you know? Yeah. Uh, all, all officer training programs, they do staff rides to Gettysburg, uh, to right. Antietam, and really, um, I, I took that program under um, the ROTC West Point program, and it was marvelous. Yeah. Uh, and you really have to walk a battlefield generally to understand what you're being told. Yeah, of course. Uh, nothing is clearer than walking the battlefield of Antietam. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you you can't understand how those New Yorkers manage to move around and start shooting down on the bloody right. angle. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and unless you see the terrain. Yeah. Um, and um, and that that's just one of the fun aspects. I've always enjoyed military history, uh, even though it's very much out of fashion with the profession these days. Um, it's uh, the, the profession is interested far more in social history. And um, and I was trained by a brilliant Roman social historian and I, I can write on social history, but I do what they call traditional history, politics, war. Uh, religion and money. I mean, <laughs> as I often said, is there anything else you should be concerned about? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, so uh, those are the battles, uh, some of the battles that I've written on, uh, campaigns, um, wow. uh, 
in in terms of um, my research and teaching. Yeah. And um, and and I primarily went to Turkey from a professional viewpoint to work on coins. I'm a specialist in ancient numismatics. That is the study of coins uh, for scholarly purposes. Mm -hmm. And what they tell us about economics and all sorts of questions of iconography and the like. Um, and I worked in the museums in Turkey many years in Ankara and Izmir. Uh, the Turkish curators were marvelously hospitable. Um, and that's one thing I have to say about working in Turkey in Asia Minor is um, the hus hospitality of the population. I don't know how many times I've driven a car in an irrigation ditch and, uh, and the Turkish farmers, you know, pull it out with chains. Wow. Uh, and you know, I had a graduate student with me and we had a day off from the um, excavation at Metropolis. So we drove down to see some sites to the south mm -hmm. on this wonderful lake, Lake Bafa which is really an arm of the Aegean that's been enclosed and turned into a lake. In antiquity, it was actually part of the vast Bay of Miletus, mm -hmm. uh, where the Battle of Lade was fought, uh, the great oh. naval battle that ended the Ionian Revolt in 494. And I always like to tell my students that that's the only naval battle you could drive to in a bus. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the island is now a, um, a hill, right. <laughs> uh, but we were down there and backing up to return to the excavation. Um, and uh, she backed up the car and got it caught on what was probably part of an ancient staircase that hasn't been excavated. She's all panicked. You know, what do we do, Dr. Earl? Dr. Earl said, don't worry about it. You should see what I've done. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I said, I don't know what you're going to do, but we're going to go up and have lunch there. You see those fellows? They're going to help us. And sure enough, they came down from this, uh, you know, outside dining and, and, and got the car up and running. We went up there and they'd been catching fish in the lake and we had lunch and then drove back to the excavation. And I said, you know, you just have to, you just have to get accustomed to this. You know, right, right. Right. <laughs> not, not a whole new world. That is yeah, great. it is. It is. And I, I um, really, um, the conceptions of uh, what the daily Turks are like are, are so misconceived. And um, I've spent 25 years of my life on and off and I love the country. Uh, I love the population. I married a Turkish wife. Uh, I deplore the current regime, which I think is as despicable as it comes. Uh, we need not make too many comments on that unless the AKP is listening. Right. Uh, well, they have other reasons to throw me in jail, I'm sure. Um, but um, in any case, um, and what, what really riveted me was the fact that I came there to study the cities of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. Greek cities that turned themselves into early Byzantine cities. Right. But if you spend so much time there, you travel this countryside, you learn about the continuity of Anatolian life in its village construction and its diet, everything, yeah. uh, manners, the hospitality. And you are in a period in which you're looking back to the very beginnings of civilization. Yeah. And then you're looking forward to all these other civilizations, Byzantine, Seljuk, Ottoman, Ottoman, the new Republic of Turkey. And you can't help but become interested in the entire con continuum of that history. Yeah. Because one period influences your understanding of the other. Well, what came next? And I think that's the great human desire in studying history, as Plutarch would, would put it, the pothos, the yearning to know. Uh, my wife always asked, uh, asks me when I do these things, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, and why? And I say, Chunka Bilmik um, Istiorum, because I want to know, I want to understand what comes next, what came before. And I think that. That's a normal human feeling to yeah. understand where we came from and where we're going. And, and Turkey has been, oh gosh, uh, over half of my adult life experience has been wrapped up with that peninsula. Wow. Um, and uh, so when I lecture uh, to my students and I'm talking about that part of the world, I know it immediately. Now I've lived in Germany for almost two years. I know the Rhine frontier extremely well, the upper Danube, I've worked in Italy, I've worked in Greece. Um, 
all of these areas, uh, I'm not a big fan of Roman Britain. <laughs> there's too many Brits <laughs> doing Roman Britain. I just, okay. no, there's no reason. <laughs> uh, uh, every, every object the Romans ever carried to Britain has been duly cataloged by the local museum of whatever. And yeah, in, yeah, I'm sure. The Kingdom, they just go, and I, and I applaud them because they've made incredible uh, discoveries there. But honestly, Britain was the least important province of the Roman Empire. I was, was going to say, I would say you, know, you could sink it in the North Sea and the emperor wouldn't really care. Yeah, just exactly. Allegiance back to the mainland. That's yeah. what I mean. The locals yeah. probably care more than the Romans did. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, so whereas Asia Minor uh, in the Roman Empire, say in the year 100, was a population of 12 million. Oh, yeah. Uh, and hugely. 575 worth. cities uh, were permitted to put to issue their own coins under the Roman right. Empire. Yeah. Uh, the tourist trade in the Mediterranean world was built between 70 AD and 235 AD, vast <laughs> amounts of uh, construction. Uh, and yet, you know, I became interested in the Hittites, mm. uh, the first people ever to um, establish uh, an empire uh, and an empire based overland. They didn't have the advantage of the Nile or the Tigris and Euphrates. Right. They built what eventually became the road system of Turkey. Yeah. And uh, Treaty of Civil Alliance. And then you have the Phrygians, Lydians, um, the various Hellenistic kingdoms. Yeah. Finally, Rome, Byzantium, and then the arrival of the Turks. And I've, um, all of them have contributed and changed the landscape of this uh, remarkable peninsula. So that's probably a long winded answer about why I ended up in Turkey. <laughs> no, but that's all, yeah. No, that's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Again, like you said, this has been such a big, uh, such a big part of your life. It's it's good to understand in depth what brings you there, you know, and and why it's become such a big part of your life. No, that that's fascinating. Well, you can convey to your students um, that this is a reality. Mm. That it's just not words in a textbook and some right. formidable half tone plates that half the time you don't know quite sure what it is, you know. Right. Right. Uh, a, a, a photograph is a, it, just like a map. It's a often a, a two-dimensional rendering of a three-dimensional reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I often will have students uh, ask me, well, why didn't the Roman army go this way? And I said, have you ever been there? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, uh, someone who's, uh, you know, who can climb Mount Everest, yeah, he can get through with no trouble. But right, right. 25,000 guys, uh, uh, you know that adage that army moves as fast as its slowest element? Right, uh, right. <laughs> yep, yep. And, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to go that way. Right. <laughs> you yeah. don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Getting the supplies over and everything. Oh, yeah. Miss yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, so. Um, I babbled on a bit. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's why I brought you here. <laughs> um, so Anatolia early on kind of sits at, at, it feels like at the periphery of these sort of cultural centers, right? You have Greece over here and then you have these Ionian civilizations kind of on the edge of Greece. And then you have, you know, the, the Hittites and they're kind of at the edge of, um, at the edge. They're of, at the edge of the Near East. Right, yeah. right. They're at the edge. They've entered the concert of powers in the areas fairly late in the Bronze Age. Yeah. Mm, right, right. And so how does, but then, of course, the Romans move in, and even for the Romans, this is kind of a peripheral area, right? But then the Byzantines take over, and, and this ends up being the, the center of their civilization. So could you yeah. kind of explain how this goes from sort of a peripheral area to a, a cultural center? Well, uh, there's two periods in ancient history. One we call the Bronze Age. The other is sometimes designated the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. The break is around 1225, 1200. And civilization, urban literate civilization that started in Egypt and Mesopotamia started in river valleys mm -hmm. and then spread out. Right. Uh, you also had a related civilization in the Indus and the Shang and China is really middle bronze age. Uh, but those civilizations affected the surrounding areas and you have the spreading of urban civilization out into Syria, into Northern Iraq, into the rugged regions that were to become the historical land of Armenia, right. uh, Iran, Iran uh, and above all Anatolia. Mm -hmm. uh, Greece also was part of that. Greece probably 
in the Bronze Age was really on the fringe. Right, uh, right. And yet, even at that time, the Greeks who built the first successful civilization, um, and it comes in two phases, first Minoans on Crete, then the Mycenaean Greeks in the mainland, uh, they were already exploring the Western Med and pushing out um, these civilizations collapse. I think one of the main reasons is for military and fiscal reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. And that the newcomers that arrive as mercenaries, immigrants, and invaders um, are comparable to the breakdown of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. It sees the collapse of urban civilization in Greece entirely. It sees the fragmentation of the Hittite Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and the Asia Minor and Greece take an enormous step backward for several hundred years. Yeah. However, civilization, urban literate civilization does hold on in the core areas, Babylonian Egypt right, uh, and Assyria. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Assyrians will eventually reunite the Middle East into one of the most yeah. successful empires of their time. Yeah. Well, the Anatolians and Greeks um, by 600 BC have recovered. There you now, and you now have a wider civilization. Um, Anatolia's development as more than a periphery is in part a result of Persian rule and Greek settlement on the shores. Mm -hmm. And by the time Alexander the Great overruns this region, and he does it at the Battle of the Granicus, the whole of Persian Asia Minor falls on that May day. It's really right spectacular victory. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I've studied at Gordian, which has the largest number of Hellenistic coins in an archaeological context in Turkey, is mm -hmm. the rapid monetization of markets, the building of Greek-style cities across the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And it would be the successors of Alexander who developed this urban-based um, Greek-style uh, culture in Asia Minor and the expansion of the arable and uh, trade and all of that. Uh, so that by the time the Romans have come, it's a very wealthy area. Yeah. Uh, and the Romans take it over in a series of wars and then ransack it ruthlessly mm -hmm. to fight the civil wars. Right. Um, and, uh, but it's rehabilitated under the Emperor Augustus and the emperors. And it becomes one of the most wealthy areas of the Roman East, um, especially the Western third of Asia Minor, the Romans called the province of Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that goes back to an ancient Hittite word that got reinterpreted by the Greeks and the Romans adapted it. Right. Uh, by the year, say 200 AD, um, one third of the Roman Senate, the great families, the imperial elites, uh, in the capital, their families came from cities in Asia Minor. Mm. Wow. Uh, about 40% are Italian. The families have been resident in Italian for a long time. Uh, another 15% come from the Roman province of Africa, today Tunisia, and then everyone else. Mm. Um, and the cities of uh, Roman Asia Minor, which were very conscious of their Greek origins and pretensions, you know, Alexander slept here. And right. right. I, I, they literally have a house in Priene where the citizen, this is where Alexander stayed. You know? <laughs> right, right. And, and there are a lot of cities that call themselves Alexandria, and we suspect that Alexandria, that Alexandria was not established by Alexander, but right, uh, right, you know, right. he would have done it, right? Um, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and one of the, uh, the uh, issues I've studied is how these ancient Anatolian peoples Hellenized themselves, linked their ancient gods to Greek equivalents, built Greek style temples, and then went to the Roman emperor and said, you see, we're a real Greek city. You know, Heracles was here, Dionysus. Uh, we deserve special privileges. Mm. And there is this enormous correspondence uh, recorded on public inscriptions set up all over them place in, wow. these in which the city styling themselves as a Greek style city state with elected magistrates and assembly a council uh, would politely tell the Roman emperor remember we're friends and allies of Rome you know you are uh, ruling by example you are not a despot because the fiction of the Roman emperor was he was the first citizen he wasn't really an emperor and um, and in this exchange, they keep reminding the emperor, well, remember, uh, we helped Rome um, against Hannibal or 
you know, whatever, Mithridates. Right, uh, right. Our sanctuary goes all the way back to the beginning of time. We should get tax privileges. We should be able to elevate our festivals to a higher level. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be international sacred games, which means when we put on our games in our town, um, contestants come from all over the Roman world, and that means money. Uh, right, right. And, uh, uh, and I, uh, one, one city I studied is in the middle of Asia Minor today. It's the um, village of Shabda Hizar. It doesn't even have 4,000 residents. Um, well, it has one of the best preserved temples in Turkey. None of the tourists see it because it's too far from the shore. The cruise ships can't get to it. Mm. But it had a spectacular theater um, and stadium back to back. Wow. And they're expecting thousands of pilgrims every year arriving to watch these games because their temple got international recognition by the Emperor Hadrian. Right. Yeah. And it completely transformed the city. And this goes across Asia Minor in city after city. And so it was just natural for these upper classes uh, to look to Rome for patronage to the emperor. They could reconcile their new Hellenic identity with political loyalty to Rome. And in the end, they essentially removed the emperor of Rome from Rome to Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's what essentially happened. Right, yeah. Constantine, whose career started in the West, I mean, he's proclaimed by the Western army in Britain at York on July 26th, um, 306 AD, Constantine recognized that's where the wealth is, that's where the uh, power is in the Roman world. In, in the Eastern provinces in Anatolia was one of the prizes. The other was Egypt. Right, so, of course. You know, those two provinces together were essential. So, um, and it's an interesting process to watch because it's forced me to look at what did Romans think of Greeks and what did Greeks think of Romans? Yeah. And people speak about Greco-Roman, and I don't know what Greco-Roman is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a Greco and there is a Roman. I don't know if there's Greco-Roman. I mean, right. yeah. I mean uh, they are very distinct. The languages are very distinct. Uh, yeah. And yet you get this fusion and the result with Christianity would be the Byzantines. Right. And, right. And, and that, to me, going from you know, classical Greek and to the Roman Republic and Empire, to Byzantium, to the Tyria, to the Crusades. It's all one continuum to me. It isn't, it isn't some jarring difference. It's, it's, it's right. following the story to a logical conclusion. Um, right, right. And, and that accounts for my wide range of teaching. Um, hmm. And again, Anatolia being one of my focus, uh, really my focus of the last 25 years, I spent yeah. more and before that in Greece and in Germany, but um, sometime in Italy, Sicily, but much more so. I was always fascinated with the Rhine frontier. <laughs> yeah, I find that to be a pretty interesting place. And then, I got, then I got cut up on a sideline in Scandinavia, which I always loved as, as a boy. Um, wow, yeah. You, know, you can't go wrong with the Vikings. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, always. If, when I offer my course called Age of the Vikings, it's usually just listed as Vikings. Yeah. It fills within the first half hour. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and the rumor among the undergraduates is that the final project is to build a longship, sail across Lake Pontchartrain and sack a monastery. Um, <laughs> and I try to assure my students that this is an ugly rumor and that, you know, this is not really the requirement. Please don't say that to the dean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As that would be. <laughs> yeah. that, uh, I, I think that that course is due for the fall of next academic year. There are yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds fun. I better sign up. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's really, you know, this is, you know, but, um, but in any event, um, yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's because of my wide ranging interests, my um, uh, incredibly mixed ancestry, where I have so many different nationalities in me that that uh, you know, everyone led me into. Well, this part of the family came from here. Well, what goes on there? You know, right, right. Very exactly. much an American product that way. You know. Yeah. I, uh, 
I, I, I suspect if they did my DNA, it would probably go haywire. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yes. Yeah, that's crazy. Could all this DNA be in one person? I mean, yes, it is too much, too much. <laughs> well, my ancestors, uh, the last name is English, but uh, they came over in the uh, as indentured servants uh, oh, wow. in 1680, 1686 and, uh, from Northern England. But they would marry anything young and an exotic that would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now we like have males. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh wow! And, uh, there you go. So you, you know, I can't even keep track of what. Right, right, yeah. Uh, at this point. With, with the ethnic and religious backgrounds of all my ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, uh, and so, to me, it's uh, it's an academic interest, you know. When yeah, people, there you go. Uh, tell me, you know, the last name comes from here, and you know, and, and I, I'm always curious, you know, why did they move? How what what, what motivated them? Because mm -hmm. I ask the same questions of um, of why did the Hittites enter Asia Minor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or uh, what caused migrations into the Roman Empire? You know, mm -hmm. uh, what what's at work here? And so. Um, um, the motivations of the Crusades is something special. Boy, um, God must really have been with those guys for the first. <laughs> time. Never have made it to Jerusalem. Yeah, I was going to say, especially that first one. That was crazy. Uh, yeah, they pulled it off. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was the uh, uh, modern sensibilities are usually offended by the religious war of the Middle Ages, but everyone raged it and everyone accepted it. Mm -hmm. And really, the the assault on Jerusalem, uh, July 15, 1099, I teach a seminar on, on Byzantium Islam and the Crusades, was a stunning success. I yeah. I cannot believe they pulled it off. Yeah. They should never have gotten there. Well, <laughs> they should no, yeah. It should have been wiped out in Asia Minor. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Way, right, way before. No, yeah. absolutely. Those, that's a whole other set of battlefields. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I'll be back for that one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so as you said, it sounds like really what happens is the, the, the Roman emperors kind of get lured in by, by the wealth of, of, you know, these Greek city states. So yeah. now, of course, Alexander's empire falls apart as soon as he dies. I mean, it just completely fragments. Right. But it seems like uh, Anatolia ends up breaking up more than other areas. I mean, so, you know, Seleucus walks away with a, a big chunk of the empire. Meanwhile, yeah. Anatolia is fracturing into like eight different, you know, eight, nine different kingdoms. Why does it's, this place break more than the rest of the empire does? It's it's a mini continent, the same way India is. Mm. Where imposing unity over the subcontinent of India is extremely difficult and has only been yeah. done successfully on several occasions. Anatolia is a mini reflection of that. Mm -hmm. And it is still reflected in the diversity of Turkish dialects and way of life today, despite the impact of modernization, universities, yeah. moving of people to the cities. Um, my wife who comes, I, we were talking about her uh, before the interview began, she comes from uh, east of Euphrates in a region the Romans would call Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. uh, and grew up in a small town north of uh, the ancient medieval city of Edessa. And there is real prejudice to people coming from that area because their Turkish is not uh, proper. It is not the, the high Turkish uh, of Ankara and Istanbul. Right. And one of the things my wife uh, was trained to do was to speak proper Turkish. She was a school teacher for 33 years, but her mother and grandmother spoke a very, very distinct dialect. Um, when I've had cases of um, a car breaking down, I was with one of my graduate students, uh, he and I were driving to Erzurum, the coldest city in Turkey, yeah. uh, and um, the fellows who finally got us and brought us in, they were speaking a bizarre mix of Turkish and what seems to be Kurdish, kind of wow. practical mix. Um, and it's got so many distinct regions. And you said eight, yeah, that's the seven, eight major mm -hmm. geographic regions. You have the central plateau, which really approximates the conditions of the Eurasian steppes. That's why the Turks originally settled in the center. Right. Uh, you have the Western shore, which is very Mediterranean. You can't tell the difference between the Turkish shore and a Greek island. Mm -hmm. Then there's a hinterland to it in the river systems, uh, you have the Black Sea Shore, which is an entirely different region. Uh, 
uh, once you cross the great Taurus Mountains, which cuts that peninsula off, and you move into the areas to the south, ancient Cilicia, ancient um, uh, parts of what would, would have been called Syria, uh, you're in a whole different world that's Middle Eastern. Uh, right. The region of the Hattai, um, which is a survival of the ancient word Hatti, which was the land of the Hittites. You know. mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Hattai, whew, the city of Antakya, ancient Antioch, Mm -hmm. looks like a city that belongs in Sicily. Population speaks a lot of French and English. Most of them are Shia. Um, they complain about Ankara to no end, but they don't want to be part of Syria. Right. Uh, and um, they're really a hospitable group of people, uh, marvelous. Uh, but it's its own little world. Um, and that's um, the setting of Indiana Jones and uh, in the final of the three, right. what was yeah. that? Last Crusade, was that it? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. With Sean Connery, by far the best. <laughs> I, I'm addicted to um, uh, classical biblical epic spectacles. Yeah, there uh, you I go. I love the old movie. That's what got me in, interested in the ancient world, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Um, drive in movies, now a completely lost art <laughs> experience. Yeah. Uh, my wife wants to go to one, but I can't find one in the vicinity of New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and I've often told my students that my, my goal was to be a writer, producer, director of classical biblical spectacles. And then they made Cleopatra, which destroyed the genre. It never made its money back. And right. well, it had to become an underpaid professor of classics. <laughs> you know, some of my students actually believe this. Uh, and I have to caution them. No, no, no. Yeah, just, right. uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, the regions are so different that from the start, no one, uh, neither the Antigonids in Macedon, who got the Macedonian kingdom and tried to control Greece, uh, the Seleucids, who were based in Syria and Babylon and Iran, or the Ptolemies, based in Egypt, but mm -hmm. having a wide influence in the Mediterranean, especially naval bases, they, they couldn't really control the entire peninsula. Yeah. Um, you had recalcitrant uh, local populations in Cappadocia and Pontus who carved out their own kingdoms. Alexander never went there. They just bypassed them. Right, uh, right. You have areas like uh, Pisidian Highlands, which are, you know, city of Sagalassus, you can understand why Alexander didn't go to Sagalassus, it's the middle of a mountain. Um, <laughs> right, right. And uh, there's, uh, then you have these crazy Celts you know, sweeping down uh, from the Balkans who yeah. invade the Galatians and had more confusion. Right. And so it was just a medley of kingdoms. The Seleucids controlled Sardis and part of Western Turkey and the route to Syria, but they couldn't control the rest of it. And the Ptolemies, had alliances on the shore. And it was only the Romans who fought their way across that peninsula and eventually incorporated it. But that took them 200 years. Right, right. Uh, to turn them into provinces. Um, and the prosperity and changes under the Roman Empire meant it was turned into a Greek Orthodox Christian heartland for the Byzantine state and remained such until the arrival of the Turks in the 11th century. Uh, the defeat at Manzikirk, boy, that's an interesting town to visit. <laughs> Malgazer. Um, the battlefield is clearly the plains off to the west of the city today. And uh, the Ottoman fortress is on top of what would have been the Byzantine fortress. And if you stand up there, it's now a cafe. <laughs> 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 That's cute. Yeah, and uh, and there's also a hilarious. Um, um, uh, they're called the Pillars of Asia. These two monuments that look like they're the monolith out of um, a space odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> And there's this huge arena and these Turkish nationalist groups periodically get there to hold rallies about we beat the Byzantines. And, and, it, and if you read the signs all in Turkish about how they explain the history, it's just hilarious. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it, it tells you a lot more about Turkish nationalism right, than, right, then, than, yeah, than yeah. the Byzantine world. Uh, but you can see exactly what happened to poor Romanus's army. Uh, 
very clearly by going out there and, and studying the overall situation. Yeah. Uh, precisely where the battle was fought, we don't know, but mm -hmm. it, it's clear that this was ideal terrain for Turkish cavalry. Right. Uh, and um, and it's um, uh, absolutely its own little world, that, mm. that part, part of Turkey. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's amazing when a um, government, um, whatever you want to authority, can impose a fair amount of unity over the peninsula. It's very difficult. The Hittites achieved partial unity. Right. Uh, it's the Persians who impose a real unity. Yeah. Um, Alexander's empire, for various reasons, broke up too quickly. The Romans and Byzantine. And then when the Turks come in, there is no unified uh, Turkish state in Asia Minor until the Ottomans finally shut down all these independent guys. And that takes them in the 16th century. Um, uh, and uh, it's... It's what happened in the aftermath of the First World War was a vast movement of populations. Um, the concentration of Turkish speakers and Muslims into Asia Minor, you had had the Armenian genocide. Um, yeah. And that, that's an issue that will get me in trouble with, uh, with some viewers. But um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I um, the best scholarship on it and I've been in touch with the scholar and uh, he's actually Turkish and mm -hmm. a very nice man in my opinion. Uh, he has demonstrated to me a question that was always in my mind. I always would say the deportations in 1916 had the impact of a genocide. It was certainly genocidal in impact. In eight months, 80% of your population has disappeared. Mm. From Ottoman records, you can prove that just in eight months. Um, killed, um, over a million fled, 400,000. We had no record what happened to them. They probably died. Um, right. And then there were, there were incidents before and then later in the 1920s, but in that alone. And it's been demonstrated that, and I said, but the debate is over intent. Is this what the government intended? And uh, Tanner Aksham, to my satisfaction, finally proved intent. Wow. Um, that was what uh, Talat Bey, the interior minister intended. Right. Um, when he marched those people out of the six Eastern provinces to a desert region, which incidentally is where um, Al Qaeda has retreated because no one wants it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the ministers are saying, well, how do we transport these people? How do we get them there? You know. We the railway isn't even completed. And his comment is, well, don't worry, they're never going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> Moot point um, right. Right. for him. Um, so um, what happened is the entire um, ethnic and linguistic composition of Asia Minor changed uh, really between 1914 and 1922 mm. um, uh, tremendously. Yeah. Um, and uh, most of Eastern Turkey that is now Kurdish, um, those Kurds moved into those areas in the aftermath of the genocide of the Armenians and also a lesser genocide committed, committed against the Syrian Christians, mm. uh, Syriac church. Um, and so uh, that is a, a major shift in the peninsula which was very different before. You had um, a much more mixed peninsula reflecting the um, diversity of the peninsula. Right. You know, yeah. uh, at the time of the Greek uh, attack of Turkey, the Greek invasion and uh, the war, uh, Izmir was the largest Greek city in the world, much larger than Athens. Right. And, uh, and the Christian and Jewish Greek population fled to Athens. Uh, uh, there's Nea Smyrna, New Smyrna in Athens. Uh, one of my colleagues in the English department, um, uh, who's now retired, uh, his family were uh, um, Greek-speaking Jews who had fled uh, Smyrna, Izmir, to Athens. And uh, um, of course, Tom was born in the U.S., but but his family goes back to that. Right. That place, right. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So. Hmm.
Uh, but the question is well taken. It's difficult to do. That's why I'm always impressed by the Hittites. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's always impressive when somebody's finally able to, to take an area and write, knit it together into a cohesive you know, unit. And the archaeologists there, headed up by a German team, have done marvelous work, including reconstructing how the walls were built. Wow, um, yeah. Uh, there's a section of reconstructed wall there, and you can go on a website um, if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find the link for you. Okay. And um, he's, um, you know, he's like, I am, you know, you go there, um, you, you run around um, this country for years, and you end up marrying a local wife. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That's, that's like a solid scheme. <laughs> yeah, um, completely, completely in line with what I said about my forefathers. You know? right, right. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> no, got to keep the tradition. She said yes, which of course, of that. Which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I proposed to her in Istanbul. Uh, I was flying back from. Actually, I met her. Um, and a friend of hers who was an acquaintance. Mm -hmm. uh, these two Turkish women, one of them was uh, is Turkish American. And uh, my dear friend, Jason Sanchez, a student of many years, but an avid uh, uh, amateur archeologist and a, an expert in ancient China, actually. And we've traveled all over the world together. Uh, and uh, uh, so the four of us uh, were to look for the roots of Lucullus and Pompey in the in the in the third Mithridatic War, and I met my wife uh, at the city of Malatia, which is the Roman legionary base of Melitene, mm -hmm. and um, and it was instant attraction, and uh, and after she left us after a short time, I had to go back to the U.S. and then I was returning to Turkey. I was on sabbatical leave for the for actually it turned out to be a year, and. Um, and I'm ready to marry her immediately. <laughs> so um, I uh, uh, learned Skype um, and worked on my Turkish very carefully. And we talked, <laughs> and uh, and I think she had been in my physical presence a total of five days um, in Eastern Turkey and in two days in Istanbul before I returned to the U.S. And when I asked her to marry me in a restaurant in Istanbul. Uh, I was stumbling and she being the school teacher was correcting me um, as if I was a very slow child. <laughs> and then after the question was finished, uh, she got so flustered that she couldn't quite get the word of that out, meaning yes. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was on a bus to Izmit, Nicomedia, and first talking to my wife who spoke no English and then her sister and two nieces. And after five hours, my brain and my Turkish had hit a limit, but somehow I had passed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, those, the years of marriage uh, to Sema, uh, and we were finally married at the end of 2013, because it's a long process. And actually the US government um, is very, very concerned that the marriage be legitimate and the woman not be taken advantage of. Um, and the fact that I, we were much older in life and neither of us had married before. Uh, and I spoke a considerable amount of Turkish. This was a legitimate marriage. They, they this was not. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, but it's amazing, the background checks they do on me. Yeah, uh, little, wow. But particularly on me. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and in any case, I've learned more about modern Turkish society mm. than all of my years as an academic. Um, right because uh, it's immediate concern to my wife. I've met yeah. her family, her family aspirations. I've attended the marriage of one of her nieces. I mean, yeah. it's a whole different window on modern Turkey, which I would never have had if I had remained single and a scholar. Right. I had been single all my life, as had she. Um, so in any case, that's part of the experience. Yeah. Um, I haven't been able to travel due to COVID, but uh, I do miss her family, and I hope at some point we will be able to go back and see them. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, uh, that's that's a personal aside. I don't know. Maybe you want to I cut it. Yeah, uh, that's fine. I mean, again, you met her over while doing research. I think that's amazing. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. I've never done things the simple way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too easy. Um, so to go back to, to uh, the, the ancient days, so 
as you said, uh, Anatolia, Syria, Egypt, these end up being the, the rich, the wealthy half, right? right? The better off half of the Roman Empire. But Justinian, after losing the Western half, right, and he doesn't lose it, but, you know, Rome loses it. He tries to take it, and he has, uh, actually, uh, I would give him an incomplete. Yeah, there you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, he did Africa. That was a success, but boy, Italy was a mess. Oh, Italy was a mess, yeah, and, and they never even make it back to Gaul. But so uh, he, he goes okay. all the way, right, and he tries, you know, he, he get right, like you said, he gets Africa, he gets most of Italy, he gets a... a you know, toehold in, in Hispania, but, but right. He's already got the wealthiest half. Do, do you I think know. this was kind of a mistake or that this was a, a bad idea in the long run for him to try and, and go on this kind of pride project to reunite this other half of the empire? Yes. It's, it's being driven by several factors. One, he sees himself as the director of Constantine and he is a Latin speaker. He comes from one of the few Latin speaking regions of the Eastern Empire. And he's very conscious of the imperial heritage that there was once a single empire. Um, he also um, calculates, and, and this is when I teach my seminar on Justinian, we do a whole session dealing exactly what did Justinian really know about the West? Where is the sources of information? What did he see? Right. And with the exception of Roman Britain, which really probably never factored into it. Yeah, right. Justinian's historian Procopius thinks um, the English Channel is um, really the River Styx, and that's where the dead go over, you know, you know who cares about Britain? Uh, uh, I'm sure my English colleagues are going to be delighted with my remark, <laughs> but you can read it in Procopius. Um, but he's, he, he's driven by this vision. And it is a reversal of what emperors had followed in the fifth century AD. Mm. Uh, he had excellent resources, financial. Uh, he had a reformed military. Uh, the Roman army is actually winning battles again. Right, uh, right. Go to the battlefield of Daros and see what the heck Belisarius did to those Persians. I mean, we yeah. know where that battlefield is. It's a right, right. right. Um, and his vision of the West was that it really just was a group of barbarian intruders who were ruling over Roman provinces and the population yearned to be reunited with the rest of the Roman world. But the West had changed. Mm -hmm. There were all sorts of factors he couldn't see yeah. um, in terms of economic life, the status of cities. Right. And as you went from Italy and Africa farther north, Roman institutions had been breaking down faster and faster. Right. He could never have retaken Gaul. Yeah. Uh, and he is getting information from international merchants, uh, usually clergy coming from the West, and especially coming from Vandal Africa, telling about all the persecution the Aryan kings are doing to us, or the Visigothic kings. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he's getting reports. Um, and they have a, uh, there's also exiles that have been driven out of these courts that arrive. And the exiles are always, you know, what exiles always say, you know, the people really love me. It was just a few crazies that ran me out. Um, you know, we've heard this always. Yeah. And so yeah. his source of information suggested to him that with his excellent field army, all he had to do was lure the um, Germanic warriors into a single battle or two and wipe them out and everything would return. Right. Well, right. in Africa, for instance, no one had collected taxes for 80 years. They had no idea what to do when they got the province. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and within 18 months of conquering Athens, Africa, the army mutinies on Easter 535, why it hadn't been paid, why there's no taxes coming in. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, if that doesn't tell you we got a problem here, in the meantime, yeah. Justinian has transferred Belisarius and all his best units, and especially his officers, and the study of, Bel of uh, Justinian's officers is, is a significant point, you know, he these guys all went through the same schooling. Um, they're fighting in Italy and, and the Goths are fighting the one war he can't win, a war of attrition. Right. Uh, and uh, as soon as that, when the Roman army occupies Rome on December 9th, uh, 537, and then Viticus and the Goths show up, you know, by the end of the year to put the city under siege, Justin is flabbergasted. Uh, this is not the way it was supposed to go. Uh, 
And the siege is raised, but the Goths retreat north uh, and they wage a um, campaigns of small wars. Uh, they do capture Viticus and Ravenna, but it just drags on. Right. And then you have the misfortune of the plague running through. That doesn't help very much yeah. either. Right. Uh, but, but he was driven by this vision that he is the new Constantine. Mm. And he could not restore the empire of Constantine. It's also what drives him to try to unite the imperial church, the, mm. uh, the Western church of Rome, the Eastern Chalcedonians centered on Constantinople and the Monophysites in Egypt and Syria. Right. And he's striving for a common formula so that the three confessions can agree and we can stop excommunicating each other yeah. um, and have the single church that Constantine envisioned. Mm -hmm. So he's drunk deeply of the Roman order. And that vision of Constantine is, is, is believed by many um, medieval monarchs, Charlemagne, yeah. Otto, one of my favorite, Frederick II, absolute enfant terrible. I mean, Frederick is really one of the most outrageous and interesting figures of the Crusader age. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. He, oh. yeah he, he convinces the Sultan of Egypt to give back Egypt, uh, uh, Jerusalem. Right, right. And he's, he's excommunicated on yeah, this crusade. Right. And, and and the Muslim side. This this guy is actually intelligent. He he knows Arabic. I mean, he's really smart. And right, uh, yeah, where did he come yeah. from? You know, it's not like what we've been dealing with for the last several generations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, and, crazy uh, life. But they've all you you could bring it down to Charles V. Um, oh yeah. And 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 the advent of the Reformation. This vision of a united Christian Europe, uh, going back to Constantine, and Justin is the first to try to implement it. And yeah. he, he does bankrupt his empire. It, it, his, his, his successes are Pyrrhic in the end. Yeah. Yep. And uh, the only thing they really hold on to for any length of time is Africa. Uh, the peninsula of Italy is shattered, the unity within years of his death. Yeah. And Italy remained, well, one could question it there's still a united Italy. Uh, right. Yep, exactly. There is in Italy right now. It, uh, it breaks up into regional states and city states through the whole of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and yep. until the 19th century. Yep. Um, so, um, and the emperors who follow him, uh, you know, they bravely fight to retain the legacy, but with Heraclius, who comes to the throne in the middle of crisis in 610, it's clear that the empire's future is in the East. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Greek becomes the official language. Right. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so he's, he's, a, he's an incredible figure. He dominates the sixth century AD. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And the wife is absolutely oh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was as savvy as they come. Yeah, the sixth right. century, especially the Byzantine world, is full of, of just absolutely marvelous figures. And first rate people. You know, yeah. his legalist Trebonian, his generals are absolutely superb. Oh, yeah. the, the junior officers who serve these generals are great. You, you yeah. got that whole Roman professional army back again. Right. You know? Yeah. Oh, no. Right. Exactly. I mean, students was... are always amazed how I'm citing all these um, different ex consuls who are commanding armies and uh, in the Roman Empire or mm -hmm. the magistrates who command in the Roman Republic. You know, these these officers are just in their own par with those guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. And since the Battle of Adrianople, Rome hasn't been winning many battles. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> A long spell where it's not been very good for the yeah. Imperial Army. Um, yeah, for sure. But he, in the end, um, I wouldn't say squandered, that's maybe too harsh, but he um, he overreached. Yeah. By far. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, so followed by him, this is of course, you know, about four centuries later, but um, of course you have Alexios and Alexios is trying to save uh, Anatolia, right? The last hold mm -hmm. they have uh, from the Turks. Um, so now they lose the battle of Manzikert. How How devastating 
do you think that was for them? Because the, the fourth crusade is really where they're set at a point where I don't think they can recover. But a lot of people think that there was a point after Manzikert where, where the Byzantines could have recaptured Anatolia and, and you know, kind of figured out their situation. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, you do these um, alternate history sessions, and that's one that probably is actually worth pursuing. Mm. Uh, uh, because from the experience of the Byzantines dealing with steppe nomads north of the Danube, yeah. and that was who people who were originally known in Bulgars and Avars and others, mm -hmm. um, the Turks who arrived in Asia Minor and established themselves on the plateau were pastoralists. Uh, they were a minority. Um, there may have been as many as 500,000 who eventually moved into Anatolia from Central Asia over two centuries. Yeah. The population is 12 million. The vast majority are Greeks and Armenians. Um, and they've had success in converting to, to Orthodox Christianity um, um, nomadic princes who then bring their people over. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, the Sultan of Konya, uh, Iconium, uh, the leading fellow on the plateau, uh, really lived in the shadow of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And Alexis was extremely good, as was his grandson, Manuel, who to me mm -hmm. is one of the most attractive figures of the Comenian dynasty, uh, in courting the Turks and coming to terms with them and uh, sealing marriage alliances and other deals in the hope that they could convert them because these Turks had come from Central Asia. They represented people who had converted Islam oh, about 250 years earlier, but their Islam was very, very thin. You know, uh, it was mostly a folk Islam. They, were, uh, they loved Sufi mystics that they would call a hoja, a mentor. And gee, these look like our shamans and, 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 and we could still smoke hashish and yeah. <laughs> send the great tree and, and see Tengere of the oh, eternal blue sky. Yeah. Isn't he Allah? I mean, they, they made the equivalents really easy. Um, and so um, there was some reason to believe that. Um, and the hope was uh, luring Western Europeans as mercenaries that could be used for methodical reconquest of Asia Minor. This is where Alexis made his mistake. He did understand from the previous 125 years when the Macedonian emperors had restored Byzantine power um, that the Western Europeans put great stock in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. There had been many pilgrims who had passed through the Roman the Byzantine empire under safe conduct. They entered the Fatimid Caliphate, uh, which is at odds with uh, Baghdad, mm -hmm. uh, and they were under protection there because Cairo and Constantinople had an agreement. And he thought, if I could play on those sensibilities, I could I could get mercenaries. Well, the trouble is, Pope Urban pulled the rug from under him and said, uh, liberate Jerusalem. Right. And, right. Um, and so instead of 2,000 mercenaries, he has half the armed might of Europe uh, showing up under his walls. Right. right. Uh, and demanding food and passage and God knows what else. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, 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 it backfired. Um, and um, the result was he had to juggle uh, the Turks in Asia Minor, those obnoxious Normans in southern Italy who were attacking Greece, and, and Tancred and Bohemond, who had been right, right. in the First Crusade. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, uh, he did the best he could. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And, if the Byzantines hadn't been so distracted dealing with the Western Europeans and the whole problem of the Crusader states, they may have had some success in bringing the plateau under control again. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. The region doesn't really get Islamicized and the population shifting over to Turkish mm -hmm. until the later 13th century, the 1200s. Uh, it is still overwhelmingly a Christian land. Uh, this is well uh, revealed in certain river valleys, uh, particularly the Alara Dere, which in Greek is the Perestrema, mm -hmm. where you have these painted cave churches that persist under Turkish rule. Uh, and the last of the uh, churches there is dated to 1294. Um, and by 1300, the area is now going Turkish. And so there was this window um, in the 12th century uh, 
yeah. uh, where particularly Alexis, his son, John, uh, the brother of Anna Comena, the historian, she just despises her younger brother to no end. Um, she had a thing for Bohemond, by the way. Okay. Uh, she thought Bohemond was great. Um, flared nostrils and all, and all. I mean, she, <laughs> I okay. She was married to this turkey husband of hers who um, she keeps praising as a historian. There's a reason why her work is translated and his is not. It's really right. <laughs> She's much brighter than the husband. Um, and the idiot actually informed on his brother-in-law, John, you know, your sister is scheming to um, uh, put us on the throne and I'm not really in favor of becoming emperor. And where Anna ends up in retirement, becoming a historian in, in the long tradition of Thucydides. Um, yeah. uh, you know, you're, you're exiled from military incompetence. So you write a military history of the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Historians yeah. do what they are particularly bad at doing. And they write on what they particularly bad at doing. Um, long tradition in Greek historiography. Um, and Manuel himself, who understood the Western Europeans better than anyone. Mm. Um, the second defeat was at Myrokephalon, uh, which is immediately west of uh, Konya today. Um, uh, September 1718 of 1176. Um, Manuel had expended great efforts to launch this attack. It fundamentally was to force a vassalage over Kanya rather than an actual conquest or occupation. Um, and the setback really broke the empire, especially after he'd been fighting the Normans for so many years. Um, yeah. And at that point, there's no chance. So I think the window was in the reign of um, Alexis uh, and the early reign of Manuel, yeah. which got completely screwed up by the arrival of the Second Crusade. Right, right. I, yeah. I, <laughs> in comparison to what happened in the First Crusade, the First Crusade looks brilliant the way it was organized and they nearly yeah. didn't take it. But the Second Crusade is so botched um, oh boy. Yeah. that um, no one is going to attempt to go across Asia Minor again. Uh, yeah. They start going by sea and, and the Fourth Crusade diverts to Constantinople. That's convenient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, the sack of Constantinople, you're correct, that finished Byzantine power. Right. The Turks are the beneficiaries. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The Crusaders actually destroyed Byzantine power, not the Turks. Yeah. Uh, now, if you watch the current series that the president dictator of Turkey loves, um, they have the founder of the Ottomans, uh, which is named Ertegal, who is uh, beating up crusaders and beating up everyone and establishing the Ottoman Empire. And it's one of these uh, Osmanli docudramas, which you know, plays to the fantasies of the Akape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my wife does not enjoy those films. Mm. Well, the one she loves uh, the most is the um, the one that translates in English as the Magnificent Century, and that's centered on Suleiman the Magnificent. And the reason it's unpopular with the current regime is it gets into all the scandal of the harem. And oh. that, uh, <laughs> it was really quite spectacularly filmed. Yeah. Um, wow! Wow! Uh, Yuz is the name in Turkish, and I don't know, it's like 123 episodes or something. But um, it, it's really a kind of fun indulgence uh, in um, um, history. And of course, um, this does not fit the, um, the current regime's idea of right. the staid Ottoman true Muslims and all of that. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, just loved it. <laughs> there you go. Well, As I said, she's, she's not the poster girl for the current regime. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, she really really does. Uh, I, I once was talking to her and I said, you realize that you married a Gavor, which is a Turkish loan word for heathen. And she said, yes, I know. And then she thought, but Jannam, which is the Turkish for my soul, I think I'm a Gavor too. So we're perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just brilliant. I uh, love that. All right. So. After, of course, the Fourth Crusade and the Turks move in and, and Anatolia is once again like it was with, with the Greeks. It's, it, it breaks up in a whole bunch it of- It breaks up, yeah. Um, it's the Mongol uh, victory at Kursada in 1243 that really shattered it. And yeah. It, it just flies apart. 
And the only reason Konya survives is as a religious uh, center. That's where the, the Hoja, um, um, uh, Rumi, uh, as he's called in Turkish today, um, the great Persian mystic who started carrying out the conversions of Asia Minor, mm. uh, that's where his memorial uh, tour day is, a uh, memorial tomb. But otherwise, Konya's political power is finished. Right. It, just, it breaks up into those seven or eight districts that you talked about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The political lines pretty much follow the geographic lines right there. Yeah. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As they often do, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the Mongols just. That much. Yeah. And the Mongols smash everything they come across. It's really just a devastating, devastating time for Eurasia as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. But so, so they, it breaks up. And why does why do the Ottomans of, of all the people vying for power in in Anatolia? Why is it the Ottomans who end up taking over? You know, not only Anatolia but the Middle East and the Balkans and this, that, and the next place. You know, well, a number of um, exceptional rulers mm. that uh, were very successful uh, up until the reign of Suleiman. Uh, we call him the Magnificent. He's known as Kanun, the the Lawgiver in Turkish. They remember for his laws. And I would consider uh, him and his father, Selim Yavuz. Um, we call him Selim the Grim, but Yavuz really means the awesome. Um, these two men um, were the pinnacle of a succession of brilliant rulers going back to Met II, who took Constantinople, um, Osman, who established the dynasty, uh, right. Orhan, who took Bursa and really built the first capital in Asia Minor. Uh, they could exploit the political divisions, uh, the hopeless position of the Byzantines, and they, of all the states in Asia Minor, were very nicely positioned to take territory from the Christians. They could always claim that their expansion was some form of jihad, right. but it mattered to many of them. Right. And I suspect a lot of the guys fighting for the Ottomans had once been Byzantine soldiers and mercenaries. Mm -hmm. uh, the Byzantine state is bankrupt. Uh, it's the Catalan expedition that wipes it out in the reign of Andronicus II. And the, um, and Machiavelli makes mention of this in his prints that the Turkish uh, mercenaries who had come over to assist in a Byzantine civil war retired. Europe. And it became a competition between Serbia and the Ottomans on who would succeed. And uh, it had ended up being the Ottomans. Uh, the Battle of Kosovo determined that. Mm -hmm. uh, and another aspect about the Ottomans that is often forgotten, because we think of the Ottoman Empire in decline, the sick man of Europe, which is not exactly what Tsar Paul said, but right. his close off. Yeah. Um, and who would know better about sick empires and SARS of the 19th century? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, any of that. Uh, that image was not true for the 15th and 16th century, where the Ottoman army is in the forefront of the military revolution mm. uh, in artillery, uh, in the disciplined Janissaries who were drilled to a level of professionalism that is extraordinary, the fife and drum of European armies of the 17th and 18th century are really the musical instruments of the Ottoman army of the 16th century. Um, anyone at Topakapi Palace who's ever, heard, who's ever heard a march of the new Janissaries when they do the full march, it's, it's dramatic. Um, mm -hmm. So um, they lose that edge in the 17th century for several reasons. Mm -hmm. um, the Europeans gain lessons in the Thirty Years' War and um, when the Ottomans are no longer distracted with Iran, which is their principal foe, um, and try to take Vienna in 1683, it's, they're just outclassed. Right. They, they lost the edge they had. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's a number of factors there. And furthermore, their, their opponents were hopelessly divided. They're fighting a, a series of regional states um, the Orthodox Christians in the Balkans despise the Western Europeans. Um, the sack of Constantinople was never forgotten. Um, and to this day, uh, the Eastern Church is still in schism with the Western Church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pope uh, John XXIII lifted the excommunication of 1054, but the patriarch has not responded. Uh, and the result is that um, the, the line that was given 
um, especially after Constantine XI converted to Catholic Christianity in the West, never sent the aid to Constantinople. Or when the aid came, it was much too late. Um, they paid the price and, and were cheated. And better the turban of the Sultan rather than the papal banner. Mm. And that allowed them to consolidate their control over the Balkans. Uh, they ran into resistance once they got outside of that Orthodox area and fought Hungary. Right, which was Catholic. Right. And that changed. Then the frontier got difficult. Yeah. Ooh, I would not want to be the Ottoman government in Budapest. That's <laughs> not you are out on a limb. And um, and once Peter the Great reforms the Russian army, it's at that point the Orthodox populations look, well, there's an Orthodox liberator now. Right. right. Uh, and, you know, Peter's first venture isn't so successful, but he's in on the war uh, resulting from the siege of 1683. And through the entire of the 18th and 19th centuries, the Turks never defeated Russia. The Russians win every time, except in the Crimean War, when the foreign minister, who was a brilliant reformer, um, Mustafa Rashid Pasha, mm -hmm. Um, convinced the French and the, uh, the British to do the fighting for him. Right. <laughs> so, yep. But, you know, in 1853, I mean, I've been in Sinop, I've seen the old naval yards. Yeah. <laughs> the Russian fleet shows up with high explosives, and the Ottoman fleet is at the bottom of the sea in a matter of minutes. Yep. Right? Yeah. It's over. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, so uh, it's, we have to forget that image of Ottoman decline, sick man of Europe, yeah. and look at where they were in the 15th and 16th century, and they were formidable. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. It was one of the great armies of that period. Um, sure. And um, it, just as good as uh, Spanish tercios, um, yeah. um, or uh, French heavy cavalry in combination with artillery. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's an army on par. It can launch great fleets. Yeah. Um, of course, no one can beat the Venetians, but um, the Ottoman Navy is formidable. Right. Uh, so, um, and that accounts for their success. Yeah. Uh, long term, they could never financially make the empire work. They were constantly in hock. Uh, in the late 16th and 17th century, the Ottoman state goes bankrupt four times. Uh, all the silver coming in from the New World, which generates the price revolution in Western Europe, it simply flows to the Ottoman Empire and goes to India. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's why the Mughals issue this marvelous silver coinage and the Ottomans are using Venetian dugots and um, Austrian tallers. <laughs> right. right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and no one wants the Ottoman coins. Uh, if you ever saw these things, they're really wretched. You can understand why the Janissaries are revolting all the time. <laughs> Uh, that's usually symbolized by turning uh, the soup, soup um, cauldrons over. That means time to rebel. Um, oh, the ending. <laughs> and it, it survives in Turkey today. It, it just uh, a couple of days ago, the, the streets of Istanbul, people were going out with their pots and, and hitting it. It's uh, symbolic of dis disapproval of the government, of taking your soup bowl and turning it over, going back oh. to the Janissaries. Oh. <laughs> Uh, when I when I read that in the news, and yeah, yeah, Mr. Erdogan has got some trouble here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so it's five thirty now. I'm going to ask you one last question before we go. Uh, you know, they the the Ottomans really set themselves up as as a sultanate and as you know, kind of the inheritor of Rome, and and they were you know a, a very. Uh, to, to put it crudely, they were a very sort of traditional style of monarchic government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that brought them all the way to the ninth, you know, the early 20th century. But then when they fell apart after World War II, they really tried to re, uh, under, you know, Mustafa Kemal, they really tried to reconfigure themselves into a nation state, right? And Kemal yes. sees this and he's like, this is what we have to do to survive. This is what Western Europe's doing. Let's, we have to imitate them to, to keep ourselves going. And you, you can see kind of the legacy of that now with Erdogan. And how do you think this, this shift to, to try and make themselves into a place that is, you know, pretty diverse to attempt to remold themselves, rebrand themselves as a nation state? What impacts do you think that's having on Turkey? Today, uh, 
One of the biggest problems is that Turkish nationalism today is being defined by who are the real Turks. Um, mm -hmm. And this is an issue that's raised even in our own nation. Uh, who are the genuine Americans? Um, uh, that issue is sometimes debated here. Uh, and that means, um, how do you account for the Kurds? How do you account for the Al Aviv? Uh, most of the Christian minorities are gone. Uh, many of the Ladinos, who are largely in Istanbul, uh, have been reclaiming Spanish. The younger ones are, complain are reclaiming Spanish and Portuguese citizenship and therefore going to the EU. And there's a drain of that educated Ladino population that goes back to the reign of Bayezid um, and the Inquisition. You know, they fled to the Ottoman world. Right. Um, and Bayezid said, how, you, how can you call King Ferdinand the wise, wise, when he gives me all these skilled people? Right. And that was his judgment on the Inquisition. And he was right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, the Ottoman Jews were absolutely essential for government contracts, uh, uh, tax officials. Yeah. Uh, and it was a very, very vibrant community, well yeah. into, always, yeah. really into the 20th century. Oh, yeah, uh, no, always. And um, so this um, nationalism has taken a virulent tone. It was always implied in the reforms going back to the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, I see the development of modern Turkish nationalism, two main trends. First, how do we reform the state? How do we, how do we defeat the Gavor? How do we keep them out of our empire? Mm -hmm. The first was they have superior weapons. And there was a lot of trouble uh, among the four uh, Sunni schools about should we learn from the infidels? And they finally agreed, well, yeah, if it helps protect Islam, we can. Right. So what we need are European style weapons. The problem is how do you produce them? And to produce them, you have to have a technology and a wage and labor system that didn't exist in the Ottoman Empire. Right. And the speed of development of weapons, and anyone familiar with um, Pursuit of Power by McNeil can easily read that, um, they're always obsolete. You know, they're, they're obsolete before they can even get their armies armed. Yeah. Um, well, that didn't work. Well, what do we need next? Well, what, what do they have? What makes them so powerful? Well, they look at France, they look at England, and they say, well, they have a constitution. We need a parliament. We need a constitution. So, you know, they summon an Ottoman constitution in this incredibly complicated um, voting pattern that really didn't reflect the general electorate at all. And then when they show up in Istanbul, they really don't know what to do because you're not supposed to tell the caliph sultan he's wrong. Right, right. <laughs> so, that, you know, that died yeah. shortly after 1876. I mean, Abdul Hamid II essentially suspends the constitution. Right. Um, and then finally, uh, the men, um, not only uh, Mustafa Kamel, but Inunu and all of these fellows who took over uh, said, no, we need a complete social economic rewrite. Yeah. You know, and Ataturk put it this way, either we join modern civilization or we don't. And he carried out these ruthless reforms that were already conceived in the 19th century. And that included, for instance, um, uh, the adopt of the Roman alphabet. Uh, the complete modern Turkish is a completely recreated language. Yeah. They threw out all the Persian Arabic loan words, brought in all sorts of French words, you know, Ataturk loved his French mistresses and French culture, um, uh, sensible man. Um, my <laughs> wife will use words in Turkish like rendezvous and, um, and I'll tell her, you know, that's French. And she'll say, no, it's not, it's Turkish. <laughs> you know, she doesn't realize it's a Turkish, it's a French loan word. Uh, and, um, you know, um, and, and, and that, so that's how you got to the point of the Turkish Republic. On the other hand, um, the current trends in who is a Turk? Um, my wife struggled to, in her elementary school classes over the years, to try to um, explain to her students that there are Turks and they're Kurds, that they're brothers, they're part of a Turkish Jumhuriyet Republic. Mm -hmm. But the nationalist strain is there, um, yeah. Erdogan plays to it. Um, that's what keeps him in power. Mm -hmm. And so um, he often talks about the real Turks, the real 45 or 50 million. 
well, who are the ones that are not real? Well, all those damn secularists in Istanbul that give them woes to no end, and especially the city of Izmir, mm -hmm. known as Gavorshir, pagan town. <laughs> you, know, you don't even you don't even hear the call to prayer in Izmir. Wow. It looks like it, the city looks like it belongs in Italy. Uh, it's a wonderful city. Best seafood restaurants in Turkey, let me tell you. Um, um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, and my wife wants us to retire there. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the um, um, and it also comes back to the fact that there is a failure to recognize the Armenian genocide. Mm. They had not learned that that's one of the big differences between, say, the Germans and the Turks on this. Anyone who goes to Germany today, you can see the death camps. You talk to the current German generation. Most of them say, yes, this was a dark age in Germany, um, but we are heir to all of German history, both its worst parts as well as its best parts. Yeah. Uh, and this is a lesson of what not to do. Yeah. And they haven't come to terms with that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to speak of the Armenian genocide can get you jailed. Wow. They regard it as Buyuk Yalan, the great lie. Um, and um, you've run out your Christian and Jewish population, so you start turning on uh, secularists, uh, Alevives, who are some kind of, they're, they're linked to the Shia tradition in a way. Um, and they're significant uh, part of the population, Kurdish speakers. Um, you know, impatient, get with the program, become Turks. Um, they were long classified as mountain Turks, claiming that Kurdish is just a bad form of Turkish when it's really an Iranian language that antedates Turkish. And that, right. you know, um, um, crackdowns even on, you know, Syrian Christians. You know, I talked to the patriarch of the Syrian church back in, in, in 2010, and we asked him, you know, he's got an American PhD, he speaks excellent English, you know, has anything changed? He says, not really, you know. Um, uh, we are second-class citizens. Um, so that virulent nationalism is a way to get parties to put themselves in power. So you have Erdogan's AKP, ostensibly an Islamic party, but Islam as Sunni conservative Turks interpret it. Right. You have the MHP, the nationalist, coming out of an old Ataturk party that is um, we are the true Turks, we are the superior race, uh, these other people get with the program or leave, and then you have social democrats, and you have the Kurdish Hada Pei, you have all sorts of groups, um, and this political fragmentation and the complexities of the Turkish electoral system meant that a minority party could take power and hold power for almost 20 years. Mm in coalition with extreme nationalists. Yeah. Even those extreme nationalists and the Islamists just really disagree on a lot of points. Um, right, right. And um, Erdogan is now in serious economic trouble. Will he get out of it or not? I don't know. Um, I do not believe he will go gently into the night. Yeah. Beat it in an election. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Sounds like, seems like a, a wise interpretation. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, um, I'm very honest. Uh, my, these are my opinions for, yeah. from years of living in Turkey. And, yeah. uh, um, and um, I would have slammed the Turkish government for buying the S-400 missiles uh, from Russia and allowing Russians on uh, a NATO uh, country's soil. Yeah. That's I would have absolutely slammed them on that. And um, at least the Congress has denied them the F-35s. Uh, their actions in Syria have been an outrageous. Uh, actions taken against the Kurds. Yeah. Well, do those differ very much from what they did to the Armenians? No, All right, no, no. At least Americans admit, uh, yes, we had racial slavery. Uh, yes, or most Americans do. Right. Uh, yes, the treaties we concluded with the Native Americans were broken repeatedly. Yeah. Uh, uh, they were shafted time and time again. They have cause not to like the pale faces. Right. I don't see them. Yeah. No one hides it. Yeah. It's accepted as fact, just as the Germans accepted fact. What right. we did to our Jews and to the European Jews in general was an atrocity. Uh, and humans have committed atrocities. And one thing is to not recognize it and think that somehow we're superior. We're not going to do it. Well, people can be 
programmed and influenced and frightening, frightened into doing all sorts of actions. Yep. And I go back to Thucydides. In war, war is a harsh teacher and brings us down to our elementary, elemental levels immediately. Mm. And that's when he describes the Civil War in Corsaira. And that human nature has not changed. No. So you, you, you do learn this. Um, you, you, you don't hide it. You study it, you learn from it, um, and hopefully you'll be better. The Turks have not come to terms with that past. Right. And I think that's going to hinder them in resolving the current crisis. Yeah. yeah. I, that's my, my surmise. Right. Yeah, that's excellent insight. I really appreciate that view. No, yeah. I, I, I wish I could say more. I, I love the country. I have been treated so well. Yeah. Um, I can't believe to tell you the number of times Turkish farmers have helped me out finding these bizarre ancient sites. Yeah, well, and it's also important, you know, for, for anybody who's interested in a country or in, in history to make sure that you separate the, the leaders of a country from, from the regime. Yeah. Especially yeah. this regime. Yeah. 60% uh, of the population despises the regime. Yeah, I believe it. And the opposition parties are so, the opposition parties are as screwed up and divided as the parties were in Germany in 1929 to 1933. Hitler took power with just over 30% of the vote. Right. And, um, and I see a comp, in that sense, I see a comparable situation that yeah. that the majority, as my wife would put it, she wants modern Hayat. She wants a modern life, mm. you know? She doesn't want to be covered in all this. She wants to live what we would call a modern Western life. Um, uh, and, um, and so do many other Turks. And the hidden secret is that so many Turks have come to the West and they assimilate immediately. Yeah. Completely. Yeah, I see that in the community. Yes, they return, you know, they retain ties with the families at home the way Italian, Greek, Spanish immigrants do, Mexican immigrants do, you know, they, they have close ties to the family. Yeah. But they're Americans. Right. The second generation is American. They're marrying out oh, immediately. Yeah. Absolutely. You, yep. And they're educated. And Turkey has a brain drain. Right. Erwin actually put in a, a proclamation that he would give all these scholarships to uh, Turkish professors studying overseas to come back to Turkey. And one fellow at the University of Arizona wrote back to Erdogan and says, well, thank you very much. I, I like the idea. Just tell me what prison will I be teaching in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, that captures pretty much uh, the, the attitude of, um, you know, the vast majority of Turks in the United yeah. States and the UK vote against the government, uh, whereas in Germany, you have large numbers of Gastarbeiter and their descendants who come from Eastern Turkey who love the regime. Um, you, you have political dissidents and intellectuals, but you have a large uh, number of German Turks who will vote for the regime. Not so in America. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the community here <laughs> in New Orleans, uh, they all get together and have a caravan uh, to Houston where the consulate is so they can all vote against the government <laughs> and spend a day in Houston. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. I gotta love that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh yeah. boy, yeah. That's why you come to America, <laughs> though, right? Yeah. Yeah, quite remarkable. Yeah. But, uh, say, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's been an incredible uh, career I've had in Turkey, yeah. and a wonderful career of 43 years teaching at Tulane, and I don't have any regrets. At least at this point, I don't have any regrets. I'm uh, 70 years old, and I've taught now 43 years, and, um, wow. yeah. and it's a splendid university. Its students are marvelous, and that's all I care about. And yeah, I have no ambitions. I don't want to be president, chairman, anything. Right. All I want right. to do is teach my classes and do my work. And yeah, be there you go. Yes. Yeah, nice, simple life. Well, and I'm glad that you've you've done that and that I've been able to interview and, and have this yeah. conversation. You know, I'm a big fan of your great courses and this is- Oh, thank you. Absolutely. My course collection thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah, I've donated uh, significant amounts of money to Audible and the teaching company. So, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, uh, thank you so much for for being on. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, okay. You know, well, uh, I, I might. I hope it's valuable to your subscribers. Yeah, I I, I hope so too. You know, um, I I think they'll enjoy this. Yeah, uh, so. if they have any complaints, they can always go after me rather than you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure they'll leave it in the comments. I don't mind, believe me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Wait, again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, okay. Like I said, I might have you back sometime. We'll see. But this is okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm booked up through December. It's a busy time. We're finishing exams and all. Mm. And, uh, we have to go late in the season because of Hurricane Ida. They've added time. So I don't finish until the 23rd of December. Wow. wow. And I have to rush off to a conference. So um, starting on uh, the new year, things will get normal again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Sounds about right. All yeah. right. Well, like I said, absolute delight to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I have a quick request for anyone willing to take up the task. My friend has a new app that I think you guys will really enjoy, but it's in beta and we need people to test it. That's where you guys come in. The link to Perl can be found in the description of any of my videos, so click on it and set up your Perl account ASAP. Perl is a free app that allows you to connect with my other fans as well as a variety of other creators. There's a feed where you can post as well as chat rooms for discussions about a wide variety of topics. If you subscribe, there's a bunch of content I've saved specifically for Perl, and you'll have the ability to message me directly. Thank you so much for your help and spread the word to others so we can really make this work for you and get more creators on here to really make Perl a success.